Hello everyone, welcome back to the Silver Screen Dudes YouTube channel. Uh, my name is Nico Luro and today I am joined by the cast and crew of Tell That to the Winter Sea, Greta Bellamachina and Jacqueline Bethany. Ladies, how are you both? Good, thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, lovely thank to meet you. you. And lovely to meet you both as well. Now, I had the pleasure of watching and reviewing Tell That to the Winter Sea. So many questions and so much I'd love to hear from you. Um, I would... Very, I'll start with something simple. So when I finished watching the movie, I sat back in my chair and I thought it's so rare to find movies where the unspoken but implied is this powerful. How did you come up with the idea of this movie? Well, we have been friends for over a decade. So we've been working together on each other's projects and sort of also, also just friends in life. So we've seen each other change and grow and you know, become mothers and all of that stuff. And uh, watching each other through these life transition has been like really beautiful. And I think that was something we wanted to explore in the film because it's not something that we see that often on screen. And we chose to sort of have a platonic relation. Well, it is portrayed as platonic and it's sort of up to the audience what happened between them. Mm -hmm. uh, because I also think that that is something, the subtlety and the intimacies between a female friendship that could be further than that or not, but it, it's universal in the deep love that these two women have for each other. And I think, you know, that I have, have for Greta as well. And I think that that was something we really wanted to explore in the movie, as well as sort of creating this very sort of ethereal, but natural, magical uh, female environment. Mm. Yeah, and I think a lot of it comes down to, we carry these, sort of childhood versions of ourselves with us the whole time and you know they kind of they kind of haunt us because we evolve but we're kind of we don't you know but our body and selves don't forget and and people from the past but also your friends are reminders of that and or it could be anything from like looking at your phone and then seeing a picture of yourself like a couple of years ago and like whoa i'm like <laughs> you know so i think there's we're kind of always toying with these people inside of us these many people um that we hold in so i think that's kind of you know a lot of the subtleties that you see on screen are trying the characters are trying to come to terms with this in real time but also you know our memories choose to remember certain things so that's also complicated so a lot of it was about how do we tell a story through these women but who are thinking a lot but not saying because time is past and i think that yeah. cinema is such a visual art form and there are so many ways you can express this a story not just through dialogue and i think that we're very interested in, in doing that as filmmakers. And the dance element was something we both had a background with and thought it could be a really beautiful through line for Joe and Scarlett in the storytelling. Uh, yeah, as you were both describing that, there's very clear like moments in the film which I was relating to your words. So yeah, lo lovely stuff. And I, listen, I completely agree. I think the the art of subtlety seems to be a dying a dying thing in film now. I mean, it was Hitchcock who said, wasn't it, that show it, don't say it if you can. And I think to that end, this movie is such a triumph. Um, and speaking of subtlety, I mean, the last time I saw a movie like this, it was Sofia Coppola's Lost in Translation. Um, I got a big, big, big energy of Lost in Translation watching this. So what were some inspirations and influences for you when making Tell That to the Winter Sea? I mean, that's a good one. I think Sofia Coppola's a good one. I think we talked, we looked at um, My, My Summer, Summer of Love. Love. There's mm. a couple other, like... Um, I also, I love Jane Campion's The Piano and, you know, that a lot of that film is, there's not a lot of dialogue, it's very visual. Um, and I think we were also a lot of French cinema and sort of Italian cinema where there is more expressiveness. And um, so, I, you know, I think it's interesting. It's always great. I was, you know, we always start with like, I'm always telling Greta to watch these films. She's like, we, we, we throw references back and forth. But I think in the writing process, there's obviously things that, and, and when you're shooting, there are things that inspire you, but you kind of want to create your own visual language. And I feel like we hopefully are starting to do that with this film. 
And um, I just finished, just before we started writing this film, I just finished making an Italian film with a, um, an Italian theater and film director who predominantly told the film through movement, physical movement. So I was very inspired by how we use the visual language of our bodies to express, you know, our innermost, deepest feelings. And both of us come from a, a dance background and, I guess, like you say, so much of it is about um, trying to create a visual language without saying it. And I, and I think that the camera, you know, sees so many so much. They see it sees everything really, depending on where you put it. So I think like mm -hmm. letting, you know, having the trust of the kind of the camera's eye and sort of letting that sort of, and hopefully, you know, my female gaze like all over this story was pretty um and the collaboration with Greta and the whole team I think is kind of the world created the world that you're seeing you've given me so many great things that I can come back on later in the interview there so I appreciate that um <laughs> hold fire on the movie influences but it's actually funny you mention Italian and French cinema now come to think of it I do see quite a lot of the Truffaut in your movie a lot of movements that you captured and tell that to the winter see yeah I hadn't made that connection. Very cool. Um, so I actually thought one of the most effective parts of the movie was the portrayal of the younger selves of Joe and of Scar. Um, I mean, to both of you, but I guess especially to Bella, how did your performance differ from playing each of the ages? Well, it was interesting because before we started filming, we had, I guess, a couple of months um, rehearsing the dances. So um, me and Amber were able to build this kind of physical intimacy, which kind of felt like we kind of resorted back to our, our teenage selves because we were just, you know, as soon as you listen to a song, you kind of become playful and you want to, you know, you start memorizing the dances like you did when you were teenagers. So it was kind of useful in a way to get into those younger versions of ourselves because there is this kind of element of innocence that yeah. we all have. And, you know, there's lines in the film which are like, you know, when I grow up, I, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm never going to do that. You know, you have these big dreams. And I think it was important to kind of, you know, hold on to that sort of, innocent side of being a teenager and you know you and then of course life gets in the way and you know you, you nothing goes the way you expect it to because that's just life yeah. so I think those sort of the rehearsals were great for that and then and I guess they were kind of we had a lot to do in those rehearsals we didn't really speak that much about anything else so actually when we were filming the sort of hen party real-time characters you know, we kind of had a lot of distance. It kind of felt sort of that there was all this under discuss, discovered and discussed stuff that actually was kind of like real life. So I think that was a good way to get into it. And I remember you made a, um, a soundtrack mm -hmm. of music, which um, the flashbacks were kind of set in the early 2000s. Um, so a lot of yeah. the dances were kind of sort of we had a playlist and they sort of choreographed to the certain songs from the playlist. And then we actually, most of the music was replaced in post. So um, by our score and, uh, and with our score and our composer. And so it was interesting how well the songs kind of, I mean, and the, the movement kind of worked like with any kind of song, like it was pretty like, um, uh, tangible in that way. And that was, that was really interesting. But I, but I also think, um, Greta and I are the same age really. And so it was like going back to that time when it was sort of like we had all the, we had, you know, Walkmans and it was like, we're into like certain music and bands that we like, that we aren't as, you know, today and like revisiting that sort of nostalgia um, was really fun. And I, I know Greta was pulling from her, you know, past self in a way and using her own sort of teenagehood as an influence into, um, the young Joe. And I think we also, you know, made a choice to keep the same actors playing those roles so that there was more of a visual through line for the audience because the film is so poetic and, you know, we're going back, back and forth between these two worlds. And so it, it didn't feel like it needed to be an entirely different kind of like 
feel and storyline there. So that was also sort of um, something we talked a lot about. Yeah, I, listen, the, and the, Greta, to you, obviously, the performance was stellar. Um, like, I, I was thinking, like, okay, they've given her a different haircut. <laughs> I'm, ge I'm genuinely believing that this was captured when you were, like, 12 years long younger. So you talk about the magic of cinema and a great performance. I was like, woof, you got Thank me. You. You. I'm glad. I'm, um, I, it was kind of nerve-wracking because, I mean, the wig helps getting into character because I think yeah. I did. I grew up in Camden, and I definitely oh. dyed my hair every single colour, like, under you know the rainbow oh you're a camden girl i am yeah <laughs> oh girl north london represent love that hey, the best <laughs> the best the best and then greta was i think in almost every scene so it's it's really impressive to sort of be able to carry the film co-write and, and i think because she had such a journey and and it is also her script there is a lot of like you can feel like the heart in her performance too you but, really can you really, really can. And okay, Jacqueline, I guess this comes more to you now as as the film's director. And you, you referenced, you know, the camera work before as well. So I, I want to talk a bit about, um, you know, the techniques for for making a um, a film like this. So I mean, especially that first five minutes of the movie was such a brilliant, silent visual story piece of these are the scenes and places that the characters are going to frequent throughout the movie. Are you almost had this kind of through a keyhole style. Uh, what's the process of capturing that um, for, for a movie like this? Well, I think we added that um, that part, the beginning sort of montage in because uh, Greta brought up, you know, it's like good to have like, to set the audience in the surroundings and see where the characters are gonna be um, rather than having such like an abrupt beginning. And it sort of sets the whole tone for the film. I mean, I think a lot of that was the beauty of the house we were shooting in and the natural landscape and sort of the feeling with, of that with the music. Um, we also used a zoom lens. So I think we actually shot a lot more zoom than is in the final film, but it was sort of this like thing that kept the audience sort of away, but then would come in at certain moments and you could sort of stay and feel the kind of tension with and the emotions of the character. Um, and I think that's important too, to like have emotional breaks from the sort of intense, you know, just emotional part of the story through these sort of more poetic montages of place and time and time passing and all of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we, we shot it pretty also true to script, but it was a very small, crew and the cinematographer who I've worked with um, for nine years or something um, was is really incredible. Her name is Irene um, Gomez Emelson and she's half Mexican and half Icelandic. So she brings this like incredible sort of like very interesting cultural background and like aesthetically her eyes is, is so rich. So I think that that sort of also informed the look of the film for sure. Yeah, and it is genuinely really beautiful to behold. And you, you really got this ethereal nature to the to the to the camera work. I mean, it, it was beautiful. Um, this next question you've kind of both answered already, but just to tap into it a little bit more. So, a lot of the time, creators talk about uh, how real people influence the characters in their work. I mean, you've kind of insinuated that the inspirations here are effectively the two of you and your story, but. Is that the case? Who were, if any, of the inspirations for Scar and Joe? I mean, I guess I was thinking about the power of first love a lot when writing this. And I looked actually like into old love letters and I was kind of amazed by just the honesty of some, you know, and the realness of those letters that I wrote and, you know, um, people have written to me, and I guess I, I'm all, I'm always fascinated by you know our ability to love and how these people kind of stay inside of us, and it kind of gets it sounds poetic, but it's true. Um, the people you love become ghosts inside of you, and like this, they keep you alive, which is a poetry quote that I love. And um, I think there's there's something about 
you know, we carry people inside of us. And uh, yeah, it was interesting to get into that headspace um, again. And I remember telling you this and you kind of equally had sort of similar stories. I mean, my, so when I was in, from about, you know, age three to, I don't know, 13, I did ballet and my best friend growing up um, was also did ballet. And like, she was much more, I don't know if better is the right word, but like she would get all the, the parts and all the things and I was too tall and would sort of stand in the back. And we actually had like, you know, in a little way, it is similar to the story. We're not very close anymore, but we at that time had this very intense bond. And so I think that also informed the writing and like remembering those moments and also wondering like how she is today because yeah. we haven't stayed in touch. Do I think like every woman and hope, you know, human watching this can relate to the story of the friendship and, um, so I think it's like, you know, just blend the blend of the poetry with the love and with the, the, the realism of the story. And I think it was important to have a kind of bittersweet ending because you we discover that it was actually Joe who was the one who was, you know, the one who was writing these letters and was leading the whole thing. And, you know, I think we're always mourning the past versions of ourselves to an extent because, you know, we're always evolving and it's kind of especially when you kind of remember, you know, those kind of innocent, hopeful parts of us that we kind of have to yeah. kind of evolve, you know, it's, I think it's nice to kind of pay homage to that. And it's kind of to remember this more gentle side of life. Yeah, well said. And um, yeah, on that note, goodness me, doesn't Scar like to hold a mirror up to Joe at some time? <laughs> I mean, you used to be like, this is like, give her a break, man. <laughs> um, so I have to say, it was genuinely a refreshing watch to see an all-female cast with the male characters literally out of sight and barely spoken about. Like, I'm a big champion for things like that. I said in, in my review, I said, there's going to be a clear demographic of people, mostly men, who are going to get offended by this movie, a.k.a. the Barbie bashers, the people who got offended by a plastic doll. That's fine, each to their own. But there were one or two moments specifically such as around the bonfire um, where comments like, I will not let a man dictate my destiny. I will dictate my own destiny, which I may be wrong here. And I'm really hoping you two can sort of give me an alternative perspective, but I felt they were a bit at odds with the tone of the rest of the movie. I felt like the dialogue exchanges, I don't know. I kind of felt like they betrayed the power of the unspoken and it maybe gave the, it put too much emphasis on the men in that instance. I, I'm thinking I've missed something here though. Um, no, what, what's... I, think, I think that it's, that line specifically comes from Jade, who I think is sort of having a crisis of uh, identity because she's also about to become a mother. And that's sort of another transition that she's dealing with. I, I believe that comes from Jade. I think it could. But I also, I think, you know, it's it's a movie and like people, we're not trying to make a statement around how we personally feel about this. And um, I don't know if it feels at odds with the rest of the film, but I, I think that it's interesting that, you know, that's something you picked up on and pointed out that we're not maybe as aware of just as, as women, you know, um, but it's not in any way to be creating an, an intense stance. And, but I, I think that this whole idea of just around like questions around women having, you know, being creating an all female cast and what that means and how that's rare and how it's kind of pointed out. I don't yeah. think that there should be, hopefully in a couple of years, we won't have these, these com these questions won't be as common, I guess. But yeah, hundred percent. I don't think like I, I don't think we were particularly. They're they're meant to be more just like a celebration of women, and they're kind of joking and jo joshing around. And it's mm. kind of like the ensemble cast is kind of, you know, they're toying with these ideas of getting married because obviously we want to celebrate this great moment, but all, obviously the other side of marriage is that you know it's this is a certain antiquatedness to it as well. So it's like, you know, it's it's sort of playing kind of devil's advocate a bit, but yeah. it's best. So it's sort of 
and everyone's kind of we kind of wanted each character to have different versions like one character is really like you know sees it as the most amazing thing and then we've got the other side of the character yeah. you know someone playing the other version of that so it was kind of having these women all kind of having this open dialogue about about you know what we're all kind of thinking and trying to understand you know and i that. think even though these characters come from different backgrounds and they're all women they all have autonomy in different ways and even though that line is said you know this is like these women are clearly independent and doing things with their lives even though jade is about to become a mom joe is about to get married like these are just experiences that women have <laughs> and um, they are able to share them and it is like her last hurrah without her husband and her baby and like that's yeah. wonderful but that's also like about to be her life you know so yeah yeah well said lovely um and listen, it's very. It, it, the reason I brought it up is because I, I, I referenced the Barbie stuff before. Because I, the moment I saw that, I was like, "Cool." And I also, I, obviously, I'm seeing this as a as a man. So I thought, "Oh, there's going to be some men who are going to have their nose put out by that." And I was. That's why I referenced the Barbie stuff. I was like, mm, "I think there's an alternative take here, and it's really nice to see that it's not." you know standing on a soapbox or making a claim it's just giving an alternative perspective i think that's really lovely to hear i love that um listen i know where we're strapped for time so i've got i've got two more questions I've, i'd love to ask you um during this production what was the most challenging part of it and how did you overcome it Ooh. i would there the weather and also time yeah. I mean, it, shooting in england shooting it's just it, jacqueline yeah, I'm American, but there were a couple of times that, uh, you know, we were supposed to shoot outside and then it would go and shoot this lovely scene in the garden and then it would be like a downpour. And so we had to sort of reevaluate where we were going to do it. And, you know, I think that we had, we shot it quickly, but so there were certain things that had to kind of change and evolve. And that's always challenging, but it's also exciting because that gives you sort of freedom in the way that you shoot. I don't know. If you have a, a difficult, I don't know if it was a difficult moment. It was just like a surprise. It was. I guess we always. It's always time. If you had more time, yeah. you could do more. And um, I think, I think Jacqueline, you're very good at stopping and saying we've got the performance. But, but I think there was like we had other scenes that we wanted to yeah. do, but we, we just didn't. Condense we sometimes. had to condense. And I guess it's just that's the. And I, and I think that with. actually, you know, the larger scenes with the the six of you took more time because you, you work, it did feel like you were kind of at a party and it was like, it was like we were, so it's interesting, like the kind of the different waves of the film and sort of how they were very different to yeah. film. Um, yeah. And they sort of complement each other because these six women were having an actual week together in the countryside, um, which I think is evident in their performances. Everyone was having a great time. Yeah, no, it very much came across. And I'll tell you what, if the weather played a part in making you <laughs> rush things up, in a way, maybe it worked because this movie, again, felt refreshingly tight. There's so many times I'll walk out of, you know, these big tempo Hollywood movies and I'm like, oh, you could have cut 20, 30 minutes off that. This felt really concise to the point and tight. It was great. Um, the last question, because I know time being an issue, they do this a lot with GQ where they talk to directors and actors and say some movies you recommend people go and see so what are some movies that you both love that you think are maybe a little bit obscure or unheard of and you want to say to people like watch this this is something it's a must watch um well the most recently uh La Tumera, like the alistair walker film i thought was really um beautiful and um i also watched a movie called Francis, which is an old movie with Jessica Lange um, about Francis Farmer that is really kind of, was a benchmark in portraying women's mental health on screen. So that's another um, maybe more obscure film that I would recommend. Yeah. I've just gone down the rabbit hole of Mia Hansen Love's um, films. And I just recently watched One Fine Morning, which is a brilliant portrayal of just caring for a parent and with Leah Sidhu. Um, Love her. I'd also uh, I'd also say Barbara Logan's Wanda because not many people know about her and she was Eli Kazan's I believe second wife and just really like one of the first female filmmaking pioneers. She wrote, directed, starred in, edited her first feature and was kind of the only really 
thing she ever made. So I think like shining a light on these women that, you know, were actually making films in the 50s or 70s, like Agnes Varda and Chantal Ackerman, these women that I feel like are becoming more lauded now in their lifetime. That's also something I would recommend. Yes. Beautiful. Ladies, thank you so, so much for joining me on the channel today. To everyone watching out there, the 30,000 people that follow this channel, tell that to the wind to see. The review is up on the channel now. I sing its praises. I mentioned that I would ask the ladies some questions today. We've done that. So please make sure you watch this movie as it releases. It's really quite a unique, refreshing watch. And Greta, Jacqueline, just before I lose you, where can people find you and what are some of the projects that you're working on that people can look forward to? We're working on a new film together. We co-wrote um, called All Five Eyes. Um, we'll be a similar partnership. And uh, there's the fire alarm. So you <laughs> <laughs> can follow us on Instagram. And, um, it's so nice to chat. It was genuinely a joy watching your movie and speaking to you both. Uh, thank you. I look forward to your next movie. I understand oh, you're about so to be evacuated. Nice to meet you. Have a great day. Thank you so much, ladies. Bye. Bye.